Good morning, Providence Presbyterian Church, and friends who are coming on to, to, to hear this message this morning. How in the world are you doing today? Think about this. How in the world are we doing today? <clears throat> As I was thinking about that, this came to mind. If I did not know our God, how in the world would I be right now? Probably fearful. Probably not knowing what's going to happen to my job, my health, uh, you know, where this uh, COVID-19 may strike again. What's going to happen if I, if I were to die What's going to happen to the things I didn't get accomplished? My bucket list. I wasn't able to fulfill things that I thought would, that would really make me happy. You see, I, I mentioned a bunch of things that are pretty much based on our being healthy, our having the ability to do it and not be quarantined. And uh, that promise that we all make ourselves, well, let me work my 30, 40 years. Let me be faithful to my company, build my pension, build my nest egg, build my equity. And then afterwards, when I retire, I could uh, go to Italy. I could go to Greece. I could go to London. I could go golf and I could hang out with, uh, you know, my family, my children. I could do things. I could be more involved with things. And you notice those things can occur and those things may not occur. Maybe something will occur that'll shut everything down. Maybe death itself will come to our door and all of a sudden shut down anything that we sought to promise ourselves or we were promised through life insurance policies, through um, getting our pension, through all these things. And do you know why all those can fail? They're based on the arm and strength of man the arm and strength of ourselves, based on the assumption I'm going to have perfect health until I'm 67 years old, and then I can enjoy. These are based on things of wishful thinking. Some call it positive thinking. And never I never bought those because, look, you could think positively all you want. When the sentence comes in COVID, could you positively get rid of COVID-19? Could you, could you positively think this is not happening? Absolutely not. Because there are things that that may seem in your control that are not. Absolutely not. We have no control over our lives. And if COVID-19 didn't make us wake up and say, you know what? I can't go to have my nails done. Or I can't go to get a haircut. Yes, I still get haircuts. Uh, you know, if that doesn't make us realize, wow, it takes one illness to shut down an empire. Who can we turn to? Well, that's what we're here today. Turn with me to Psalm 105. Because when you know and you realize God is unchanging, he is faithful, and his word is as sure as what he has set as morning and evening in one day, light and darkness. As sure as those are going to take place, are as sure as his word. And remember, that's his creation. He's above him, his creation. He's transcendent yet imminent. And in his transcendence and in his nature, God doesn't change. And in his promises, he can't change his promise. Why? Because God's ingredient is faithfulness. He can't break being unfaithful. God can't be unfaithful. God is faithful and God can't lie. Never take what you see in flesh and blood and project it up to God because once you do, you got a false God. Our God is the unchanging one who it's impossible for him to change his mind or it's impossible for him to change his covenant promise. Let's open up to Psalm 105 and let's bow for a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for preserving this word. We thank you for bringing us this word that enables us to, to fully affirm the things that are necessary that we can count on, and that's knowing you. Lord, I pray that as we open up your word to Psalm 105, 
that you would enable us to see how faithful you are, your covenant promises, who you are, and how we can count on you during these days of trial, during these days of affliction. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Psalm 105, I'm going to begin reading in the first verse. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read down to verse 11. There's a lot to it, but I want us to really key in on Genesis, um, um, on Psalm 105, 1 to 11. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he has uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant that he made with Abraham, he has sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. This is a reading from God's word. Children of God, children of his covenant, do you hear these words? I mean... As I read these words, there is so much meat in this text. You know, we look at Psalm 105, and when you come to the Psalms, the first thing you got to recognize is God has inspired the very lives you and I go through, the ups, the downs, the peaks, the valleys, the looking at others and how they prosper and how we may not. And He, these words that are penned were God-breathed in order that as the psalmists, Asaph, David, uh, and others who wrote, four or five of the writers of the psalms wrote, and in the experiences of their lives, God has shown that we are no different from they. And during times when there's trials and when there's judgments of God coming through, he gives us his steadfast word, his assurance of knowing his presence and his promise that not all will be lost to us because he has secured a covenant and he has made that covenant. He has assured us for over uh, 3,800 years of his covenant faithfulness that he has something in store for us, a land of Canaan which is sometimes called the land of Canaan, the Beulah land, the place where there's mansions, where there's fields, where God is going to be waiting for us, that he has promised us. And he gives us his word to sustain us through these things. Let's look at Psalm 105. The first thing we are called to do based on these promises is give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. All right. What deeds does he want us to make known? Well, when, when we sum up what he says in verses 8, he remembers his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for thousands of generations. The covenant that he made with Abraham that he sworn to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, as a law, which means it's never going to be broken. And to Israel, his people, his church included. It's an everlasting covenant. That covenant that he will give us a land. Let, let's look at it quick. In Genesis 17, 2, he says this. I will make my covenant between me and you, Abram. See, I'm going to make my covenant between me and you, Abraham. And I will multiply you greatly. Okay? Now, you got to remember, Abraham was as good as dead. 99 years old. He was told in the following year, he's going to give birth to a, the promised child, a child that will come, and God's going to make his covenant with him, Isaac, and then make his covenant with Jacob. So Abraham believed in God's word, trusted it. He says, in Genesis 72, I will make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. 
Then in verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me, you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations. So God is going to maintain that covenant throughout their generations. Remember what we just read, that the covenant that he made with Abraham in verse 9, he confirmed to Jacob, you know, it's that covenant that he says will go through a thousand generations. He's reaffirming it in Psalms. He's saying it to Abraham. He's reaffirming it right now to us listening. It's that constant affirmation. He says uh, in Genesis, I will establish. When God establishes something, it's sure. Because it's established on the very character of God, unchanging. Unchanging, no one, no power, no entity, not all the empires and all their glory together in one could thwart Almighty God's promise confirmed in statute to his people throughout their generations. I will, this is God speaking, I will establish my covenant between me, you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. And what is that covenant? I'm going to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God to us. Do you hear that? That's why Paul can say, my God. Imagine being able to have God as our father, as our covenant, as, as the one who made covenant with us before we were even born. He made a covenant with us to those who have placed their faith in Christ because we're going to see how that covenant is based into the ultimate one person, Jesus Christ. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 17, he says this, I will surely bless you. He's continuing that promise. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of your enemies. Again, he promises that to, from Abraham to Isaac. He makes that promise. He says, I will bless you. I will multiply your offspring. And they're going to be like the sand on the seashore. In Genesis 35 to Jacob, and he said to him, I am God Almighty. Do you hear that? Genesis 35, 11, God says, I am God Almighty. No one could ever claim the title of El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. That means God can do all things according to his will. And two things that God cannot do. One is be unfaithful because God's nature is faithful. And two, God cannot lie. So what he says, it's set. It comes from the one that no one could ever, ever alter his word or change his covenant with us. He says, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. A nation and a company of nations. Church, you are Israel. You come from the loins of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The seed, the covenant promises if you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, Peter tells us, then Sarah is your mother. Because Sarah was the one who gave birth to Isaac, the promised son, in whom Abraham trusted God's word and it happened. So he says, I am God, be fruitful, a nation and a company of nations shall come, whether you're from Sicily, Naples, Scotland, England, South Carolina, North Carolina, Connecticut, Los Angeles, China, um, Singapore, South America, wherever you're from, out of that he'll bring a people. And they will get, and I will be your God. You will be my people. And he fulfills that for us. Uh, then he says this. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob in Galatians 3.16 and to his offspring. But now he specifies this. He says this. It does not say to many, many offsprings in the sense that through the seed of Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. But he brings it to the true seed, the true Israel, the true head of the covenant, Jesus Christ. Referring to, referring to one to your offspring who is Christ. Which means that all the fulfillment, all the promises of God, folks, every single promise of God, is yes and amen 
including the promises of him being and sealing that covenant promise. See, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17, when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the heirs of the promise that you and I believe in, it also says to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose. What did God do? He guaranteed it with an oath. I swear, God swore to no one greater than himself. And he confirmed that covenant. That covenant that when you believe in the offspring, the promised offspring of Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of that covenant, that covenant promise, we have Abraham as our fleshly father, uh, Romans chapter 4, because he says these promises are to Abraham that we are justified in Christ and we are forgiven in Christ and we have that covenant blessings that God will be our God through the propitiation and expiation of our sins. So he continues on in Hebrews 13. He says, now may the God of peace who brought up again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. See, folks, God's covenant promise is shown in time through Abraham, but that covenant was an eternal covenant. God saw, ordained, and decreed that fall in order for what? That each of us, by the eternal covenant that Christ placed, the eternal covenant that God says uh, from everlasting Christ was set forth as a propitiation for the sins of his people are confirmed to his people. So we can rest in these things. Now when we look at all these wondrous works, that everlasting covenant that God made, the shed blood before the foundation of the world, he says this, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. We give thanks to him in Psalm 105. We give thanks because he has done for us something we can never do for ourselves. We're going to be able to call upon his name because what does he say? I am your God. You are my people. We can call upon him because we're united to Christ. And in turn, because we have that relationship, because we have that confidence that our God is God, what will we do? We're going to make known his works among the peoples. So we're going to sing to him. We're going to sing praises to him in verse 2. And we're going to tell of his wondrous works. His wondrous works didn't end when he, we closed the book. Isn't he working in your lives? What has he done for you? What has he shown you by his mercy and love? Where has he placed you undeservingly in? Do you see Christ? Do you see the blessings that we have? Do you see the things that God has blessed us with? All the heavenly blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus? Do you see that it was given to us before the very foundation of the world? That he chose us in Christ before the foundation, affirming that covenant with us that I will be your God, you will be my people? And what does he say? We're going to tell of his wonder. We could tell people about the wondrous works he has done in our lives, the wonderful covenantal relationship we have with God because of his blessings, because of his grace, because he has opened up our eyes, because he has revealed his son to us and confirmed the covenant within us. So we have that assurance. He continues now, he says, in verse 3, glory in his holy name. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. We have all things when we have God. We don't need anything that we could touch, see, and feel. Our faith assures us. Our confidence confirmed into us by his Holy Spirit, by our faith. And if we, and if we have our eyes to see, we can see that our prayers are answered. Even when he says no, our prayers are answered because our dad knows what will benefit our souls. Because sometimes we come to him seeking things for our flesh. Look, COVID-19 is so anti our flesh but he's put in our lives, it is a blessing. It is a blessing. Because look, you're listening here. We're taking the time to embrace God's wondrous work for us. We're to seek his holy name. We're to glory and we're to seek in the fact that we can rejoice in him. He has given us time to grow in him. Four, we're to seek the Lord and his strength and seek his presence continually. Christian, 
we live by his strength. We place no confidence in our flesh, none whatsoever. We know because our eyes have been opened to see what confidence can I put in myself? What confidence can I put in anybody else? No, my, my motivation, my daily point of living is to seek the Lord and his strength knowing I have done in myself. I will seek his presence continually. By faith, I know when Jesus, I am with you always, he is with me. And I will seek his presence because I will seek that communion, that fellowship. I will call upon him and seek his strength every single day while I live in the world of clouds, of stress, of depression, of bad news, of sad situations, of broken hearts, of loneliness, of all these things. Then he says, again, remember the wondrous works that he has done. We got to constantly call to memory his wondrous works because folks, let's be honest with ourselves. How many times do we forget his works in our lives? If something occurs in our life that's contrary, how quick are we to remember they're wondrous, they're meant for my good? Even this temporary period of suffering, this light affliction, or whatever you're enduring right now, it's literally meant for our good because nothing could ever take away what God says. Listen, God says, there's nothing in all creation that could separate you from my love. There's nothing in all creation that can separate you from the covenant promise that I have given you. Whether life, death, angelic powers, beings, uh, governments, whatever it is, nothing can separate you from that love. When we consider that, we have to remember the wondrous works that he has done, he is doing, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. And he pleads specifically to who? In verse 6, O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He's calling on us. He's calling on you. Those who have placed their faith in Christ realize God has given you a new birth. He's opened your eyes to see Jesus Christ, to believe in him. And if you're able to see them, he says this in verse 7, he is the Lord our God. He is the Lord our God. Our God. I will give thanks. I will call upon his name. I will make his deeds known. I will glory in his holy name. I will seek the Lord with all the strength. I will remember his wondrous works because he is the Lord our God. His judgments. He remembers his covenant. Genesis 12, Genesis 17, Genesis 22, Genesis 35. He remembers his covenant, the fulfillment of it. Galatians 3, the unchangeable character of his covenant. Uh, Hebrews 6, the eternal covenant that was made in all eternity for his people. He says he remembers his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for a thousand generations, he said it to Abraham, he said it to Isaac, he said it to Jacob, he said it through the prophets, he said it through David, he confirms it through Jesus Christ. You're he hearing it today, he's confirming it in our ears. The covenant that he made with Abraham, he sworn a promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statue, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. Okay, what land is he talking about? Abraham didn't receive that land. Isaac, temporarily, Jacob, they had a fight for it. But what is he talking about? Turn with me to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to begin in the 12th verse. Because, folks, we are sojourning right now. We're living in a land that's not ours. A matter of fact, in Acts 17, he's predetermined where we were going to live, the time of our existence, who's going to be in our lives, who are, who are we going to be, who is God going to put in our lives in order that they may also know the deeds of the Lord. Consider this in verse 12 of Hebrews 11. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, Abraham, this is going back to the covenant, and this is reaffirming it to God's covenant people. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, because he was 99 turning 100 years old, what life is there in him? Okay? We're born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, as many as the innumerable grains of the sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised. See, they weren't given to them temporarily because you know what if god gave them the land temporarily, they would have never looked 
beyond what God was giving us. Anything here is temporary. And God is showing them, as he's showing us today, we're to yearn for, for what he has in store for us. He says this, These all died of faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them, greeted them from afar. I see, Lord, beyond these words, what you have in store for me. Do you see beyond the words? Do you see beyond the physical to the actual spiritual reality? Remember what Jesus said? I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come back for you so that you could be where I am forever and ever. In my father's house are many fields. I'm going there. He's preparing a place. There's our Canaan. There's our Beulah. There's our land. He, they say this. Having, uh, he says, having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on this earth. This world is not our home. This world is not our home. Where, where we live, it's all temporary. We could be on a family farm. We could be on a house that we've inherited from our family. We could build on a piece of land our house. I always look at those houses that are his, in historic districts and says, this is the house of Samuel Morris. This is the house of Stephen Austin. This is the house of uh, Abraham Lincoln. Okay, uh, Some are preserved as well as everything else, but of course everything else is different. Um, some of them, they're, you know, they had to be updated. I mean, those houses that were in the 17th century, they didn't have electricity. They didn't have air condition. Imagine if that person came to life and appeared in their living room. And all of a sudden, what is that square-like thing showing me somebody in my room that's really not in my room? What is this light? Why is it so cold in here? It's, ju it's, it's, ju it's July. What's that noise coming? You know, everything is temporary. Everything changes here. See, God is pointing us to put faith in him into a promise that is coming from his very character. We just have to recognize, I'm a stranger here. I'm a steward here to what God has given me. I'm a steward to the property. I'm a steward to the monies he's given me. I'm a steward to serve him here, um, to make an impact in the culture that I'm here because God placed me, he's funded me, he's gifted me with himself and things in order to bring forth his kingdom, to bring forth that covenant message to others. So I could tell of his wondrous deeds. So I could proclaim what he has done in my life. So I could share these covenant promises. Consider, we're strangers and exiles. Then he says in verse 14, for people who speak this way, make it clear that they're seeking a homeland. See, if we think, I'm going home, I'm heading back to my house, what are you thinking? See, when we realize, I may be here for 20 years of my life, 60 years, what's 70 years of life? What's 80 years? What's 85 years? At 85 years, what do we have left? And then we leave it. If our heart is here, death will be extremely hard for us. If what we love is here, if we have not continually meditated on the preparation of what God has in store for us, we're going to have a hard time. We won't want to leave here. A matter of fact, when God gifts us, there's that natural tendency in fallen man to love what's on the master's table more than, what's, more than the master. And we always have to constantly call the mind, I'm a, I'm a sojourner here. What I hold in my hand here I'm not going to hold forever. What I cherish here, I'm not going to have. It may be our loved ones, our children, our mothers, our fathers. We realize when death comes, we don't have them. We don't. So we got to constantly meditate and remind ourselves this world is not my home. We have to constantly call it to mind because when we speak that we are strangers and exiles, that anyone that's in our lives are only given to us temporarily. God has given them to us. As we sojourn in this world, we may not have them all our lives. And some of us wives have lost a husband. Some of us have lost a parent. Some of us are in the process of losing a parent. Some have lost our children. Take what he has given us and remember, I cannot hold because God has a time and a date for everyone and everything. If he has given them to us, hold on to them during that time period because that's all you have. And if they are in the covenant, 
you will see them again. But start to think consistently, we're exiles here. Because when you speak this way, you make it clear, we are seeking a homeland. Nothing here will stop our feet. We're on the pilgrim's progress. Verse 15, if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they could have had opportunity to return. Look, you, you could go back. But see, God has you. And if God has you, you're going to be looking forward. Because if you go back, you're going to lose it anyway. You can't retain it. They knew this. But as it were, in verse 16, they desire a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Do you realize that God has prepared for you a city? A kingdom that cannot be shaken. An eternal home in the heavens awaiting for us. And he did this because he confirmed did to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. He confirmed it to us. Folks, let's consider the fact that when we can say, my Lord, our God, when we can give thanks to him, let's consider this day what we are giving thanks to him for. We are giving thanks to him for his eternal covenant. He has confirmed throughout generation to generation, he has been faithful. When he says a thousand generations, we're still preaching that covenant to you. You're still hearing that covenant. And if you're hearing that covenant, you're being extended mercy to hear that covenant. God is calling you. If you're not in Christ, if you do not know God as your father, this is a time where, look, God has caused the earth to shut down. I, I look at it, there's 195 nations in this world, on this globe, 195. They're all afflicted with the COVID-19. In God's justice, he's showing forth love and anyone who's hearing the message of his faithfulness. A thousand generations later, we're in the year 2020, this was proclaimed in 1300, 1600 B.C. And it's constantly been repeated. This is mercy. Turn to him. See that this, there's no hope here. One illness shut down a world because God is merciful and he's faithful and he's seeking his own. Are you his own? Have you embraced the covenant promise that's found in Jesus Christ? Are you willing to turn and repent from your sins, from your selfishness, to start to serve the living and true and eternal God? Are you willing to proclaim his deeds and to make him known? Are you willing to say, I'm a sojourner here? Are you willing to hold loosely, loosely the things of the earth, knowing that you can't hold on to them? You're going to let them go when he calls you out. But you know what you can hold on to? His promise, his everlasting promise. I will be God to you and to your offspring after you. I will give you a homeland, a, 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 a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Lay hold of it. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Turn from your sin. Trust in him. And folks, the greatest joy we have is to be able to say, Oh Lord, my God. Oh, Lord, great is your faithfulness. Great is your comfort. Great is your presence. Great is your love. Great is your mercy. Great is your justice. Great are you, oh, God, my God. There's no other person. There's nothing on earth that is like our God. Put your confidence in him and rest in the assurance, I heard his covenant. I want to embrace that. I want to be in that covenant and embrace the our covenant head, our Jesus Christ. And may God bless this reading, bless this message to you, and have a great week. And we'll connect next week. And Providence Presbyterian Church, I love you. Uh, those of you who uh, are hearing this message, subscribe to the button. You'll get messages like this. We're doing Bible studies and meditations. They're, they're, they're on our link. Uh, you know, we're faithfully reforming. And, and if we're going to be faithfully reforming, we are calling churches. We're calling individuals. 
God is calling attention to the churches. He's calling attention to individuals. He's calling attention to everybody. This is just the beginning. This, what is occurring, is just the beginning. Pestilence is just the beginning, folks. God is calling you. Don't let this message turn you aside. Embrace him. Amen? Amen. Have a good week.